Hey everyone, hopefully you're having a good day. My name's Andy, my channel's Finding Value. Uh, today we're gonna go over oil and renewables. Uh, I like going over oil just because I feel like we're going into an oil, uh, not really, an, it's an energy crisis, but I feel like oil's kind of our leader here. Um, I had a uranium clip that, that, that came out, so we'll keep, uh, keep going forward on oil. I've got some inventory numbers on this one. Uh, that's one that I really kind of wanted to share. Uh, we've got some other uh, articles that I want to go over, and uh, we'll jump right into it. it. says, OPEC gets further behind oil production quotas. Uh, OPEC raised its crude oil production by a meager 64,000 barrels per day in January 2022. All 13 members of OPEC, including the three producers exempted from the OPEC Plus quotas, uh, pumped out about 28 million barrels per day. The biggest increases in crude oil production came from Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and Kuwait. So that's uh, OPEC, and they continue to get further behind their quotas. Uh, we've got a little bit of renewables here. I said the outlook for utility scale renewables sours after record year. Uh, the new utility scale renewables capacity is set to break records in 2022, hitting all, an all time high of 220 gigawatts. Uh, globally, with investments surpassing 300 billion for solar and wind combined. However, a slowdown of capacity additions could be around the corner as construction startups of large scale projects are expected to stall. Despite record capacity additions in 2022, the outlook is not uh, not all positive. Projects expected to start construction this year will face challenges are challenging economics, delays, and even cancellation risks. For instance, rising steel prices are already having an impact on onshore wind projects, and utility-scale solar photovoltaic developers are concerned about surging commodity prices, signaling a potential downturn at least for the first half of the year. <clears throat> and this is the global renewable capacity additions by year, region, and type. Uh, you can see them kind of moving on up here uh, with the different types of renewables. Uh, we've got solar, photovoltaic, offshore wind, onshore wind, pumped storage, battery. And then these are the areas that are getting it. It's very heavily uh, Asia and North America and Europe. Those are the, the big three, uh, so to speak. And these are the global renewable project startups. <clears throat> and you can see 2022 is actually, I don't know if this is indexed for the entire year or what, but uh, that's what we've got so far. Looking at this, it says uh, oil rises on low U.S. inventories, OPEC's upbeat demand forecast. A bullish OPEC report on global demand and a drop across the board in U.S. petroleum inventories jolted oil prices on Thursday. Total U.S. commercial crude oil inventories are now just over 410 million barrels. Uh, so if we were to look at this, it says the total U.S. commercial crude oil inventories are now just over 410 million barrels the lowest level since 2018. The Cushing crude oil inventories also continued to edge lower, falling by 2.8 million barrels to just 27.7 million barrels. We are getting into territory where there will be concern over hitting, over hitting tank bottoms. It says the tightness of the WTI delivery hub has been reflected in the prompt WTI time spread. The, sp the spread briefly broke above $2 a barrel earlier this month, the first time since 2018. OPEC also added some support to oil prices after it said on Thursday that there is an upside potential in global oil demand as stronger economic growth and easing of COVID restrictions make the near-term prospects for global oil demand bright. As most world economies are expected to grow stronger, the near-term prospects for world oil demand are certainly on the bright side. So I've got down here, this is the U.S. oil production, and these are the year the years. Uh, 2017 is way down here. 2018, you can see it kind of pumping on up. 2019 uh, is the gray line. 2020, you can see the big hit in the orange line. And then in 2021 is the light blue line coming through here. So we are producing like we have been in 2018. Problem is, demand is higher and our inventories are getting eaten up. So what does that look like? Uh, this is our crude oil stocks, our inventory. 
This is the five year range. This is our weekly. Look at this thing just keep continuing to decline and decline and decline. And where are we going to end up here? Are we going to head up, end up way down here at a very low level for, uh, for oil? It's a possibility. U.S. gasoline stocks, you can see this thing going up and down. We're on the low end of the five year, and we'll see where this goes uh, coming up in the spring summer. It's going to be very interesting to see how both of these move. Uh, I suspect with OPEC not producing to quota that this will decline and gasoline stocks will find out where those end up. Looking at uh, Canadian oil exports to U.S. at record level, uh, the oil sector is not the driver of GDP growth that it once was. Uh, it says, due to pipeline capacity constraints, there's little supply response to rising prices, with oil production still stuck near 2018 levels. With export capacity out of their hands, producers have been using their income to pay down debt rather than invest. As there is little scope for an immediate supply response and it takes time for higher oil, oil exports, uh, earnings to feeding to feed through the uh, to the rest of the economy, for example, in the form of higher wages in the oil patch. There is a risk that higher oil prices initially have a modest negative impact on Canadian economic activity by eating into consumers' real spending power. And then we've got this weird dynamic going on with Europe. Uh, I've got Europe's dependence on natural gas imports hits eighty percent. Now, keep in mind that there's a conflict that could potentially be going down with Russia and Ukraine. And it says, while Europe will remain reliant on Russian gas supplies in the near term, in the longer term, this may lead to a more diversified supplier base and a faster energy transition. The uh, interesting thing is, will Russia continue to export natural gas at the supply, you know, at the quantity that they've been doing it? If they don't, and Europe's already basically in a natural gas crisis, this is going to get real interesting. Real interesting for uh, all of Europe. Now, looking at this and looking at the oil inventories and oil production, uh, I'm interested in to see what the inventories does, uh, what they do coming up late 2022, early 2023. Uh, that's kind of where my eyes are, are, are focused. Um, that is where a lot of people have said that we could run into a, uh, a demand supply problem where no matter how much we pump, we are going to be in a deficit. And if that is true, then we are going to eat through inventories like mad. If we eat through inventories, we're going to see prices do some stuff that we've probably never seen before. Um, I don't know where the prices are going to end up. Uh, I just know that it's going to go this way. And uh, then you also have to look at how we're going to play this. Um, what are the companies? And a lot of the companies you guys probably already know. If you're doing our daily technical analysis updates uh, in oil, you know the companies that I like. So those are a lot of the companies that I like. A lot of them are up in Canada. Uh, I would suspect that lower quality oil, sour crude and whatnot, um, I, have, I have a feeling that that's also going to get a pretty good bid, especially if you've got shortages in oil. So those could be maybe some of the best types of plays are kind of the oil sands, oil shale, um, th those types where we could see um, high cost producers come into the market with a very high oil price and they just start killing it. Their balance sheets, their debt goes away. Um, all of those things kind of fall to the wayside as whatever oil they can extract will get maximum dollars. So uh, I, I've, always, I've leaned towards the heavier debt higher cost producers for this uh, bull market. Um, I was an ultra bull even in the beginning. Uh, I was thinking about numbers that people were, they wouldn't dare say. And, and now some of those numbers, um, more people are, are warming up to. What are those numbers? I, I think oil's going somewhere very high. Uh, I don't think we're gonna be anywhere near $100 a barrel. Think like two to four X $100, somewhere in that range. So 200, 400, 500, I don't know, somewhere in there. Uh, it could even be higher than that. It depends on what inflation does, what gold does, and, uh, and how all this interacts and where demand starts getting cut, cut back. Uh, we've never had a market where we've had a deficit 
and we couldn't have and we didn't have spare capacity somewhere um what's coming up could be could be and I, i'm not calling for it but it, it i'm very interested to see how how it works where that capacity hits like zero so um this is going to be an interesting uh an, an interesting look at it so um my take is buy and hold don't be trading in and out uh and and and, and stick with what works for i was also looking at some other um stuff some people had some questions um they said what kind of has more upside people are very heavy in like say gold and silver versus oil and maybe uranium uh what i've calculated is that the ratios have the largest compression off of oil and uranium at this point i would say uranium probably has the largest compression still in it uh, and then looking at gold and silver, uh, silver also and platinum still have very good um, upside, well, not really compression, but a lot of upside still left in it. Now, oil and uranium peak against gold and peak against gold earlier in the cycle. Uh, and usually gold peaks behind the cycle. So the, the ratio is not going to be the lowest in oil when gold is at its highest. Uh, it will be usually if you did the if you do the calculations about 30 to 40 percent of the price move of gold wherever you start and end about 30 40 percent up on that uh, movement is where oil peaks out so for instance if we were to take a a move i'll just do a quick calculation here for everybody if you were to do a move uh on oil and let's say oil hits like eight thousand dollars a barrel uh it's eight thousand times about 0.34 is about roughly 30 40 percent uh you you have a price of about 27 20 somewhere in that range or actually it's it's 7,000 times 0.34 plus your starting price 1800 or so yeah it's probably about four i'd say about four thousand dollars so four thousand divided by eight uh, i get about a 500 dollar per barrel maximum ish type price um, out of oil if gold goes to around four thousand at the time that it's peaking on on oil um and that's kind of like the that's kind of like a best case price uh i don't know if we'll get there i don't know how high gold's gonna go uh maybe maybe uh perhaps gold only goes to three thousand dollars an ounce and we go to compress down to like 10 that's 300 dollars a barrel so i think between three and 500 is probably the the ultimate top somewhere out in the future I don't know the exact timing of it, but it shouldn't matter because we're we're sitting down here at like 92, 93, 94, somewhere in that range. And and if we go to, you know, four or five hundred dollars a barrel uh, or three hundred dollars, it's all massively to the upside. Uh, it is more inflation driven uh, in the in that number. There's a lot of inflation in there versus the supply demand balance. Uh, so keep that in mind. So uh, if you guys like the clip, give me a thumbs up. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And thank you for listening. This is Finding Value.